In this episode, I'll talk to world-renowned veterinarian and equine educator, Dr. Alberto Rulon. Dr. Rulon lives here in Ocala, Florida, where he owns Performance Equine Veterinary Services and their on-site rehabilitation and condition center, EPIC, which stands for Equine Performance Innovation Center. He was voted number one vet in Ocala, and EPIC has the honor of number one equine facility, which is no small feat uh, in the horse capital of the world, which is what Ocala is known as. So we'll talk about his three-part approach to healing horses and the importance of getting to the root cause of the injury. So here we go, episode 123 with Dr. Alberto Rulon. Hi, I'm Karen Rolf, and welcome to Horse Training in Harmony. This podcast is about you making progress with your horse in a way that you both can love. It's about learning how to move and be in harmony. Because yes, you really can develop a horse to be both athletic and happy. When we show up as our best selves for our horses, our horses will show up for us. So let's get started. Well, hello, Dr. Alberto Rulon. Welcome to the pod. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so um, I I would love for you to introduce yourself a little bit since we're, we're kind of new to each other here. So I'd love to hear, you know, you talk a bit about what you're doing now. You know, what do you do now? And then we'll get into how, how you got here. But what tell tell the world what you do and um, what you're passionate about. All right. So we'll talk first about what I do, what I do now, and then we'll talk how I got into it. Um what we do now is we we have a veterinary practice that focuses on rehabilitating that first of all diagnosing rehabilitating and treating and rehabilitating horses most of them athletes we do athletes from all levels and athletes from all races we have a pretty unique rehabilitation center in Ocala, Florida called Equine Performance Innovative Center. And we have, we're pretty unique in, I would say in the world, we are, we were able to create a, a, a place and a program that has everything you need to bring a horse from injury all the way back to athletic performance. So that means that we have let's say a horse has a, a tendon injury or has a fracture and we need to repair it so we have surgical room with orthopedic surgeons we have a, a aqua pacer to rehabilitate the muscles we have laser therapy stroke wave we have a pool we have a hyperbaric oxygen chamber we have um, a track for training we have paddocks from very small paddock to extremely large paddocks for um, further turnout, etc. So that's what we are right now. And our, our, we have a pretty interesting vision, which is uh, our goal in our center is to help a million horses. So that's, that's kind of our, our big long-term vision. Nice, nice. Yeah, I uh, drive past your place fairly frequently and it's beautiful it's such a beautiful yes, spot you. and uh yeah has a very peaceful vibe to it <laughs> yes so i'm it's it, i would love to visit and i'm glad i i haven't had to <laughs> no but please co come by for a tour <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i i will take you up on that um yeah so maybe can you share a bit about what made you get into veterinary medicine to start with? Yes, yes. I was born in the top of a mountain, very remote place in the Caribbean island in Puerto Rico. Coffee, cattle, and horses were pretty much our way of life. I would ride my horse every day to the farm, to the store, to work cattle, to train for horse shows, to hide from my mom and dad. My 
My mom would even ride, my, my dad would even ride the horse to the bar. So riding <laughs> horses was definitely our, our you know, our, our way of life. And we were very involved back in the days, not just in cattle and ranching, but we're also involved in Pasadena horse shows. And my dad and I would train horses every afternoon, six, seven days a week. And one afternoon, my dad was training before I came from school. I used to come from school around four or five o'clock. And my dad was training. And I noticed as I was driving on the, the bus, the bus, the school bus was coming in. And I saw a horse laying down on the ground because back home, you could ride on the road back, back in, you can still ride on the road actually, and you could train on the road. So my dad was training this horse and he suffered a very traumatic accident. And the, the horse had suffered for a long time. My dad was also injured. And there was no veterinarian in town that could actually care for the horse. There were so many vets and I was eight years old at the, at the moment. And there were so many, no, not so many vets, I'm sorry. There were so many human doctors at the moment, but there was not even one veterinarian. And, and, and as an eight year old kid, that really struck me. I just could not comprehend how this could be possible. So at eight years old, being desperate and being like powerless on how to help my horse, I decided that I was going to dedicate the rest of my life to help horses with leg injuries and wow. to make sure wow. that this doesn't happen, didn't happen again to while I was present, you know, and be able to, to fix these kind of problems. Because at that moment and, and still, and still today, I believe that you know, no horse trainer, no owner, no no one should go through that level of, of desperation of not knowing what to do when the horse is injured. So for the last, for the last 20, 25 years after that, that's all I did. I dedicated my life to learn how to, how to become a, a veterinarian who focuses on, on lameness. Wow. That's, that's pretty I mean, that's pretty amazing because there's a lot of time between and changes between an eight year old and then going, actually going through and completing vet school. What kept you, what kept you motivated? Was it, was it just that big a passion? You just were like, I'm going. Well, I think that the first thing that, that helped me and kept me motivated is that as I grew up, we continue to have problems in our farm with our horses. So it, that was not, that was a, the main incident, but we still had problems, but there was still no veterinarian in our hometown. And our horses got diseases and my dad was the only person in town to help them. And he was not a veterinarian. He just learned as, as it goes, you know, and kind of a, the cowboy way. And throughout my whole teenage years, it still was the same, the same deal. And I, I continue riding horses after that every day. So it was very frustrating. Uh, every time we had a horse with injuries that we, we couldn't figure it out or we didn't have any veterinarian in the area. I think mm -hmm. that was what kept me just more and more motivated and uh, made mm -hmm. it even bigger, you know. Yeah. And I, I read that you, um, you do some volunteering for, um, the equitation initiative, equitarian. Uh, maybe equitarian. Yeah. So maybe tell us a little bit of that. Cause that feels really connected to you going back and helping the situation, people who are in the situation so you that used goes, to be in. Yeah. That goes hundred, hundred percent with our purpose of, of, and that's kind of where the, where our vision of helping a million horses come from, because in in our countries and and especially in remote areas where there's no veterinarian there's a lot of kids teenagers and adults um that 
cannot take care of their animals because they don't have the knowledge and they don't have access to veterinary medicine. So it's one of the most, if not the most rewarding professional experience to go in those towns and actually know that you can make a difference. And we're not talking about a small difference. You can make a huge difference because in those countries, horses are not necessarily a hobby. A lot of those countries have horses as a, a, a tool to work the land. And it is imperative that the cowboy has his horse that morning ready to go to battle because if he cannot get the cattle, the cattle will suffer. If I cannot go and get the coffee, cannot go and get the plantains, the family won't eat. It cannot go to the market. So there's a lot of um, damage that could happen economically and socioeconomically if the horses cannot are not ready to go to work in those countries. So when you go and help them out, and then not just that, you actually teach them, which is a lot of what we do. Our, our goal is not to fix their animals, it's to teach them how to take care of their animals. And, and when you do that, you actually make a big difference. And when you do that, and then you go back and you see how they're using that knowledge, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, it's a nonprofit international organization. Uh, what was, what's the name again? Cause I'm, I think I maybe got it wrong. Yes. It's Equitarian. And now after COVID, everything changed. So we, of course, live right before COVID and after COVID. Yeah, um, right. But there, there are multiple organizations. Back in the days, they used to be called RAP, Remote Area Veterinary Services. And then then now we go with a group called Equitarian. Well, no, now we haven't done it in a while. Due to yeah. The, well, hopefully. I'm sure we're going to get back to it. Yeah, yeah. Really cool. All right. So now... <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I know you, you, you talk about three fundamental concepts that every horse owner and trainer needs to know in order to help a horse recover successfully. So that's, I'm intrigued. <laughs> so yes. can you talk to us about the, what those three fundamental concepts are? Absolutely. So in any, in any uh, medical treatment, there has to be a system where you could replicate that system and help athletes recover. So what we work is a very logical, makes sense system that takes horses from injury back to athletic performance. And these are very simple. One, anatomy. We need to know what we're treating. Second, a treatment plan. And third, a sound rehabilitation plan. The anatomy is very important because sometimes we have a horse that has an injury or is lame, and we need to know exactly what is bothering the horse. And sometimes we don't know once in a while, we cannot figure out exactly what's bothering, but we, we need to get to the, as close as possible to the area where, where the injury is happening. Let me give you an example. If a horse uh, damaged a ligament, is a different rehabilitation than if a horse damages a tendon, if a horse damages a bone, for example. That's why we focus so much on the diagnosis and what is the problem. Then another thing that we have discovered in the last 15 years is that there is very seldom only one injury. Myself, I was an athlete when I was growing up and not a very good athlete, I should say, but I did suffer <laughs> a lot of injuries. <laughs> and by myself suffering a lot of injuries, I discovered that when we are treating horses for one particular injury, we are missing a whole lot of things. So if let me give you an example. If a horse is lame on the front end, 
or has a, a tendon injury on the front end. A lot of times, this horse is overloading that front end from a hind end injury that is actually predisposing the front end. So you might have a, a bone or a joint injury on the hind end, and then it's overloading the tendon on the, on, on the left front. That would eventually give you, by laws of physics and biomechanics, it will give you a certain amount of tendonitis, or in the worst case scenario, will give you a tear or a tendon tear. And it seems like traditionally we rehab that tear. And then nine months later to a year later, the horse goes back into work. And the tear reoccurs later on. Well, what we have discovered is that when this happened is because one, either most commonly there was the tear, there was a problem going on somewhere else that was causing that overloading that did not get fixed. So that's why we focus so much in anatomy because there's multiple anatomical parts that could be damaged and knowing exactly the anatomical part that is damaged, we can then know, okay, what, what could have caused that? We call that the etiology, right? What could cause that injury? Then we go and treat both. Then you have two problems. So you, you go and we go and treat the tendon, and then we go and treat whatever caused that tendon injury. And that's what brings us to our next treatment, which is to our next key, which is the treatment plan. The treatment plan. And when I first got into veterinary medicine, the treatment plan was give it some time, turn out 60, 90 days, and Let's see what happens. That's that's when I when I got into veterinary medicine, and that was pretty much what my dad used to do when I was a kid, when a horse got lame. So, twenty years after I decided to become a vet, the treatment was exactly the same thing that we used to do back home, um, <laughs> and I, which is quite quite interesting, right? Uh, but that causes a that could cause a lot of failures, a lot of treatment failures. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So we take a horse and we establish a treatment plan based on the anatomical part that is damaged. And instead of just a limited or limited turnout, we really, really like to use biologics. By biologics, I mean PRP, which stands for platelet-rich plasma, or stem cells, or many other new products. I, I don't want to overwhelm you with names, but there's a lot of regenerative therapies. We are starting to move away from some traditional therapies, such as cortisone or what we call corticosteroids. And the regenerative therapies, they not necessarily give you a, give us a, a faster healing but it gives us a more accurate healing and it gives us a quote unquote better healing. Plus it has very little side effects. So we really, really push for natural biological therapies such as PRP, stem cells. Now there's some new ones called alpha 2M, which if you ever, you know, if you ever, um, want to learn about all the possible regenerative, you can, you can definitely go to my website, albertorulan.com. And, and you, I wrote a little book about it because there, oh, there's cool. so many therapies that we don't, we don't know about. So once we establish that plan, the treatment plan based on that area that is damaged, then we go to our rehabilitation plan. And then we have a rehabilitation plan that is designed to the anatomical part that we are treating, right? If it's a tendon versus if it's a bone versus if it's a ligament. And that process with the follow-up of examination and the repetitive treatment until it heals is what gives you the most successful outcome. 
Nice. Nice. What, um, it's really nice to see so many of those regenerative and, you know, types of treatments instead of all the cortisone. It's exciting. Um, what, uh, when you're talking about the the cause, I mean, that's something that's really fascinating to me. It's like, there's the injury, but then why was that part of their body being stressed? And I think it's interesting how sometimes we don't notice the first thing that's causing the problem. And then we often it's this, it's the secondary thing that gets injured, maybe because they're taking the weight so much off of the first one and compensating, but still being ridden and worked. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with um, Dr. Sue Dyson, who's um, described like the 20, these 24 behaviors um, that show pain in the ridden horse. And I think some of that work is so important just so we can start to recognize like, Hey, something's not quite right. (laughs) You know, even before they start to limp and, uh, and with the work that I do, it's so, um, important for me that the horses that are in work and some of the basics that the horses are working with us and in as much harmony as possible, instead of in conflict with the rider or in tension and constant contraction and, and unhealthy biomechanics. So, um, it's interesting that you're seeing that there's often one problem is actually several problems. And if we can get maybe better at recognizing those first problems, (laughs) then we could maybe prevent um, some of the secondary. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I am extremely familiar with Dr. Sue Dyson ever since I was a, ever since I was a student. She if you if you look at her book, one of her books on on lameness in the horse, she is actually co-author with Dr. Mike Ross, which was my immediate professor when I was in vet school. So I'm oh, very cool. familiar with her. Yeah, so I'm very familiar with her work, and I have read probably most of the papers, including the one that you just talked about, and and how she took pictures of the eyes, and uh, and she described the the eye it was very inter- it was revolutionary when she talked about when she took pictures of the eyes and when it was while the horse was in training and describing and teaching other veterinarians and and trainers how to look at the eye for signs of pain discomfort in the in the show ring that was that was very very interesting work yeah yeah i i had seen a little bit about her sort of floating around and i finally was like i'm going to take you know she did a online half day seminar and I was like I have to watch this and I was like I need to learn even more I mean it's just brilliant how she described it and made it measurable so that the average person and I guess that was part of her findings is that um through the the ethogram that she made like even untrained people could yes. actually identify so I think that's something that we all um, can do even a better job of. I have a question for you. <laughs> yeah, bring it. Um, stall, <laughs> stall rest, no stall rest. I know old no school. Stall rest. All old school was like any injury, like put them in a stall, rest them, and uh, and I that never felt right to me. And I usually didn't follow those directions and got my horses out as much as I could. And now now I've heard vets going, don't stall rest. So I'd I'd love to hear. Um, your take on st- when you know stall rest, no stall rest. When, what in you know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yep. Hey, when I was eighteen years old, I hurt my back pretty bad. I was working on a tractor, and I injured. I was pretty much paralyzed for several days, and I discovered very quickly that bed rest and rest and resting does not help injuries. And I think that you can relate to this as a writer. And and I have never talked to one writer that doesn't agree with me that has had a muscle strain and injury that tells me that five days of bed rest made him feel better. So (laughs) if it doesn't work as a writer, why would it work for a horse? 
and complete stall rest is definitely needed when we have 20 screws on the cannon bone. Yeah. <laughs> that is definitely needed because the implants that we use are not strong enough to withstand the, the full weight of a horse walking around. Um, however, in people right now, when an orthopedic surgeon fixes a tibia with a plate and screws, they actually promote using it as much as possible. We just cannot mm. do that in horses. But that's one of the few times that we go to full stall rest when you have an implant in the bone. When you have any other injury where can withstand movement, we want the horse movement moving. And that is why we treat so many horses in the underwater treadmill because we yeah. can have movement without putting 100% full weight on that leg. And at the same time, we move the legs in the water, creating certain friction and activating core muscles and activating other muscles that will complement for that injured area. That's why it's such a beautiful technology to have horses, to, to be able to have put horses in the underwater treadmill rather than put them in stall. And then eventually they could whatever whichever part is injured then you can go on and do the pool work instead you know if you have a horse that cannot pull a, pull, put a lot of weight and a lot of exercise in that limb then you put them in the pool which has extreme great benefits cardiopulmonary increases obviously if you have increased heart rate and respiratory rate you're going to increase, increase blood flow with any area of the body and the recoveries are pretty amazing when you get the horses moving nice well that's good to hear <laughs> yeah it always made sense to me but i always felt like i was going against the veterinary recommendation but it just it just made a lot of common sense in a lot of cases um what are what are some of the most common injuries that you see and you know how do you treat them and most importantly are there things that you're seeing a lot of that you're thinking Oh, these could be prevented, <laughs> you know, so getting into the prevention part, but yeah, some, some of the, the common things, and then maybe some categories of like these kind of injuries, and then this kind of rehabilitation or this kind of treatment plan, because you have so many different modalities there under one roof. Um, yes, great question. What are the most common injuries that we see that also goes hand in hand with the, with the sport? For example, if you ask a football coach, what are the most common injuries? They're going to tell you certain injuries, right? If you ask a tennis player, they have certain injuries. If you have a golfer, they have certain injuries. And the same thing in the sports of horses. Dressage horses, I end up seeing, and I don't have, please do not quote me on the validity of these statistics. So I'm just going to tell you, more versus less. How about that? Okay, sounds in good. <laughs> dressage, in dressage horses, I see a lot of suspensory dysmitis. We see a lot of suspensory ligament dysmitis, a lot of hot pain. And we do see quite a bit of back pain in dressage horses. Mm -hmm. in, in race horses, we see, we see a lot of joint problems. Oh, joints all through the body oh by the way there's this and i'm not sure this is new for but it's not necessarily new it's just that we look a lot more on it but in dressage horses i'm seeing a lot of neck issues in the last 10 years mm -hmm. i have i see a lot more neck issues but i think it's because one our technology is getting better and now we, we actually as veterinarians are getting a lot better at detecting Back in the days, I feel like when I would hang out with my mentors, they look at horses from the from the knee down or from the stifle down, right? Stifle, bedlock, knee, feet. And I think they used to overlook at the neck and back, um, pelvis. But I think that the more we look, the more we see that the neck is a source of poor performance. Yeah. 
uh, in in dressage. Now, in let's say we're talking about Western performance, we do see a lot of hockey issues, a lot of stifle issues, and certain Western performance performance horses develop a lot of high end suspensory issues as well. In case of thoroughbreds, we see a lot of joint, a lot of a lot of arthritic joints, um, a lot of, of fragments in the joints, um, and now we're starting to detect actually a lot of neck issues in in thoroughbred race horses as well, which back in the day oh, were significant, yeah, yeah, significantly mm. overlooked. In Jumpers, race horses. Yeah, in race horses. That's interesting because in dressage you can kind of see because there's a often too much neck <laughs> manipulation, but in race horses, mm -hmm. um, yeah, they they don't have that same. So that's that is kind of interesting. Yes, and and it is it has definitely been a a challenge proving it to the trainers, but once in a while you get that horse that has a great potential, and and the trainer lets you as a veterinarian the trainer kind of uh goes with the flow and get the neck treated and rehabilitate and the horse ends up winning and doing great and then that pretty much convinced the trainer very quickly right um so and we, and we see a lot of sport horses since we are a a full service rehabilitation clinic we we see a lot of breeds um and kind of a new dressage breed that I see a lot is gypsy vanners. I'm seeing a lot of oh. gypsy vanner dressage horses. Huh. Uh, interesting. Very, yeah. Very inter yeah. yeah. I think there's some breeders in this area, but um, yeah, that's fascinating. In the mm -hmm, so with mm -hmm. with dressage horses, if it's hawk suspensories neck, um, are those the the one the injuries they come in with? And if so, what are the secondary? Or the what are you know if you can trace it back to other things, or are those are those injuries the the originating ones? Like, did that? I don't know if that made sense. <laughs> yes, yes, you are you're asking me if there there is a if those are primary injuries yeah. versus secondary injuries. Um, I think um, I don't have the the full evidence of this, but. I see a lot of suspensory injuries in, in dressage horses, um, especially on the high end. And there's a high chance that these are primary injuries based on their work and their load, mm -hmm. right? Now, if I see a horse that has significant neck issues, and the interesting thing is that when we treat the neck issues, a lot of times everything else balances and goes away. Interesting. Or at least it's, if it doesn't go away, it becomes more manageable. Telling me that the neck is a potential source of primary injury for a lot of these horses. Wow. What what exactly are the neck injuries? Is it fracture? You know, yeah. What is arthritis or? By far the most common one that we see is arthritis. Okay. Yes, by by far, that's the most common one. Then there is a more rare one that they can have OCDs, and they can have fragments, etc. But the the end result, the most common end result, end up being arthritis in the the articular facets, which mm -hmm. is the joints in the in the neck of the horse. Yeah, and just from a rider point of view. I can imagine, you know, if there's neck issues and then there's this contraction and tension that's started from the beginning, then that's going to go into the back. And if the back isn't supple so that the whole body is sort of acting as a one big shock absorber, then it makes sense that the, the ligaments are going to be stressed because they're taking all the strain. Um, I mean, I found when horses are really you know, in contraction and tight and blocking and not really using their top line um, as well as they could. It feels like so something's got to give. <laughs> right? That's absolutely correct. hundred percent correct. Yeah. And that's, that's, the, that's the where. Na, the na Go ahead. 
<laughs> Sorry, sometimes there's a little delay in it. We jump on each other. But yeah, so that's my my fascination is from the riding point of view. You know, how can we, um, you know, ride and get this performance out of our horses without things like draw reins and side reins and all these things that force and jam horses into shapes. So that's kind of my passion is to break that cycle and get horses as loose and free and working with us and emotionally and mentally with us also. Uh, so that then when we get to the, the hard stuff, you know, the collection, the canter pirouettes, you know, we're coming in with, a you know, then it's just, you know, that's the physical fitness of it, but we're not already fighting and forcing a horse, you know, in that, place of contraction and then, and then add more to that. So that, that's kind of where my, my passion overlaps with veterinary stuff. <laughs> Cause I want to keep horses as healthy as I can through their, um, through cooperation and, and getting that as lovely as, as possible. And there's been horses that have come into my program who have had lots of chronic, unsoundnesses and students have reported like their chiropractors, their veterinarians, you know, are all like, Oh my gosh, this horse looks, you know, better than it's ever looked. So the riding part of the circle between, you know, the riding, the training, the veterinarian, it's, it's a big part. It's so, I, I congratulate you for, for doing that. And it's very commendable that you notice that because you know what sometimes I tell especially dress, my dressage riders when they have a when you notice a lot of the same injuries in the same barn and you keep seeing the same injuries in the same barn you have to wonder what's what is predisposing those same injuries horse after horse after horse and then you get the horse that is bought with a beautiful pre-purchase and is bought 100% sound and three months later that horse is already in trouble. And then you have some dressage riders that get the worst possible case and three months later that horse is actually looking amazing and competing. And naturally it has to do with what, we, what you just talked about the stress of the horse the working of the core the elasticity that the horse is actually being trained to to be that has a lot to do with it i have some dressage riders that make me look very very good and i, <laughs> and I have some dressage riders that make me look very very bad <laughs> <laughs> so interesting. <laughs> oh, so in in the in the rehab plan, um, you know that's sort of that's really nice because you do have this instead of just being a vet who like diagnose, treat, and then go all right, go home. So there's there's this rehabilitation process where you actually get a chance to help the horse regain some movement patterns. Um, is that all done in your place or um, are they going home, coming back or, you know, what are the different we rehab? Have, we have a, a full mixture. If the, if the trainer lives in Ocala, they are more likely to travel back and forth from the clinic to their farm. If the trainer is international or out of Ocala or national, they're more likely then to leave the horse in the clinic. We get horses from um, all over the United States. And I think the furthest one we got so far has been California. And, and the further, um, and we have gotten horses from out of the country as well. So those horses come in, get in a full rehabilitation plan, and we do everything but riding. And we, we turn the horse to the rider when the horse is ready to be ridden. We do all the um, core exercises, all the range of motion exercises that need to happen. We pretty much, and we give them a, 
ideally would give them a sound horse, right? <laughs> ideally, yeah, <laughs> that they yeah. that they can start building and and working further forward. A lot of trainers want to do want to be very involved and go home and do a lot of their rehabilitation at home and do a combination of of us with them and those are those are a lot of fun because we we get to see the progress more drastically because when when I have the horse in the clinic I see the horse every day so I I don't see the drastic change oh yeah but when I when the trainer comes in and then they work and then they come three weeks later and then three weeks later you, you can see the drastic change and that, that's a lot of fun we get very involved with the trainers we get very involved with them on what kind of exercises they are doing at home for how many minutes for going uphill downhill cavaletti over poles uh, stretching you name it nice, um nice. and then we get we we get the occasionally we get the ones that all needs to be done at home because of economics those are not as fun but because we we don't get to follow up until six months later and then six months later we'll figure out if if it worked or not so we have a, an array of of options that's very cool so if there is one message you could give to all the people that you've <laughs> worked with or you know sometimes when you're doing this for a long time it's like if people just knew this <laughs> What would be your your message? That's a great question. I haven't had that question. Sorry, but, I, did, um, I didn't give you that in I advance. To, no, I just threw I love, it right I at you. It. Yeah, no, I, I, I love it. I totally, totally love it. Um, I would say that if we can find out what the root of the problem is objectively and document it, every time there's a problem the chances of fixing it will double or triple if we can find out what the root of the problem is because many times we i've i feel that many times we as horse people go on on gut feelings which are great gut feelings are great don't, don't get me wrong but if they're not accompanied by objective data and, and measurable, then it's very, it is not such a successful outcome on the treatment and prevention of that issue. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. And I awesome. think we probably, I think that translates to a little bit of training, right? If you have a horse that is a, a, a a troublemaker training wise and all of a sudden you're studying that horse as a trainer and you find the root of its problems and you fix that root that horse becomes a, a an amazing animal after that yeah and, and sometimes you cannot fix the root right in training or in veterinary medicine but you can manage it you can get close and eliminate as many of the <laughs> issues as possible and some some horses are just certain characters and they're in the you know they didn't choose to do any of this so I always feel like horses are perfect until we come along and ask them to do something that they can't or don't want to do and they have you know <laughs> they didn't choose any of this so I'm always very aware of that but I like to just help horses be as relaxed and happy and communicative and then I really like to work with horses so that they tell me where they need to be in their bodies to feel as loose and supple and flexible as possible and then you know then they they think of my goal is that when I ride them they should feel for the basics feel like they just came out of their favorite yoga class or something like oh, yeah I feel great you know and then there's plenty of time to add on the the high performance stuff but um I have what I call my happy happy athlete training scale and at the base of that is that the person is a is happy person and the horse is happy separate right so when I'm not with my horse 
I want him to be happy out there. Like I can think, oh, my horse is out on 10 acres with his buddies. He's fine, <laughs> even without me. And he likes his life and that I'm a well-adjusted person. And uh, then we can come together and start creating harmony. But I, th I see so many horses that are um, frustrated, bored, stressed out. And then their frustrated, bored, or stressed out human comes to work with them. And there's these bodies that are just bumping up against each other. Um, and then add on that a lot of demand. So um, my little gift <laughs> to the healthy horses is just to try to you know, arrive to each other feeling in, in as relaxed and balanced mentally, emotionally, physically states. And, and, you know, and then injuries still happen even under those conditions, but at least I'm hopefully not causing too many of them. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you hundred percent. Love it. I, I really love your, your um, approach. It's, it's very remarkable. Awesome. Well, it would be super fun. I'm going to take you up on the, the offer to come visit your place. I'd love we to get a, a tour and see that. Yeah. And um, so thank you so much for um, reaching out to being on the pod and taking this time. I'm sure you're fairly busy. And uh, I will make sure that we have a link to um, your website. Maybe you can say your website again so people can find it and the name of um, your beautiful facility in Ocala. Yes, absolutely. Well, the easiest one, we have multiple websites, but the easiest one to find, learn about the things that we talk about today is very easy. It's alberturulan.com, alberturulan, R-U-L-L-A-N.com. That's the easiest one to learn about everything we talk about, the regenerative medicines, which are, are revolutionizing the the horse in the human industry right now, but they actually revolutionized the horse industry ten years ago. <laughs> wow, very cool. All right, well, thank you again, and uh, I look forward to um, my tour. <laughs> thank you, thank okay. you so much. And you, uh, any one of your listeners, is very welcome. Feel free to give him my number, and we'll give him a very nice tour of facilities. We would love to awesome. have. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you.